This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. We should never be overconfident that what we have prepared needs no trusting in the Holy Spirit. My Lord, the Holy Spirit wrote what we're studying. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian. I'm going to be dedicating today and tomorrow to ministers. This is about the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's on you for ministry. And I'm going to talk about that because a lot of times people don't understand. They just talk about, well, this guy's really good, but they don't understand about the anointing. Because we can study all we want to. That anointing, that presence, that tangible presence of the Holy Spirit really makes the difference. So that's what we're going to talk about. In fact, the offer has to do with the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. I think you're going to be blessed by this. So why don't we start out turning to 1 John chapter 2. We're going to take a look there in just a moment. And, uh, you know, when asked about the anointing, the, the anointing I'm going to be talking about, you know, Jesus said um, that uh, within us, the Holy Spirit would live there. He said, there's two ministries of the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit who is with you, present tense, shall be in you. And that's something that never happened before. The Holy Spirit lived in a temple in the Old Testament, the tabernacle of the Old Testament. But once Jesus Christ arose from the dead, that veil was torn from the top to the bottom. And that wasn't to let us in, but to let the Holy Spirit out. And 50 days later, he moved into the upper room where the uh, disciples were. And there's where he found a new temple. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit. But this is also called the anointing in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 7. But that anointing that Jesus is referring to inside of us is not felt. It's not tangible. We just know because the word of God says it's there that it's just always been there. And we know that we always have it. So the presence of the Holy Spirit within us is called the anointing. That's found in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 7. And it talks about that anointing abides within. So again, you can't always feel it. You just know it's there. Sometimes even the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit is something that just happens to us. And when it does happen to us, it's just, it's just there. We didn't sense it. It was just suddenly the voice of the Holy Spirit. But what I'm going to be talking about on this particular broadcast is the presence of the Holy Spirit that's upon us. It's sensed by the minister whenever he starts to minister the word of God. Not every time, because there's been times I have preached, didn't feel a thing. And yet most of the time when I preach, this anointing comes. It's the type of anointing that is a manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit. This is what I want to talk about. So again, what we're discussing is the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's often felt by the minister, of course, but oftentimes by the congregation. More times the minister senses it, but sometimes the congregation can sense it. And you know what I'm talking about. There's times I remember when I was working for Kenneth Hagin, we'd walk into a meeting and when the, the presence of God would come just by the time the praise and worship began, or Brother Hagin walked up to the platform and suddenly everybody sensed it, including him, there was to be special manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you that are raised around that, you know what I'm talking about. For others that probably never been to a meeting like that, there's just nothing that can describe it. It's just this power and sense of the Holy Spirit. I remember as far as qualifying what that anointing is, that tangible presence of the Holy Spirit, a minister was asked one time, uh, a country minister was asked one time to define the anointing. He said, well, we don't know what it is, but we do know when it ain't. And when it's not there, we know it. But we do know it when it is there. There's just, it's, it's indescribable. Just the presence, people often say it's like hair standing up on the back of my neck. I just sensed not only was there a presence of the Holy Spirit, anticipation rose in every one of us. Something was about to happen. From that same type of tangible anointing comes the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, these are called manifestations. So when preaching, that manifestation of the presence of the Holy Spirit is there. It's an anointing that's overwhelmingly brings confidence. And for a minister, it brings us a presence of scriptural revelation. Things can come to you while you're ministering. This particular thing that I'm teaching on actually uh, came from Tony Cook. And I, I get my ministries from other from other sources and stuff. And of course, a lot of them I never mention because they've been dead for a few years. And I'm sure in heaven they don't care. But Tony Cook is still alive. So, Tony, I'm using your stuff. 
You say, well, you're stealing it from me. No, if I tell you ahead of time, it's not really stealing. I'm just using yours as an outline for where I'm going on this. So if you ever, if I get to some of these points, uh, some of you'll say, well, I think you got that from Tony Cook. Yes, I did. But you know, sometimes you find stuff that's just so good, you can't actually improve upon it. I want to talk to you about nine points on what the anointing is not. And then I want to get into what the anointing is, and that won't take very long. But these points on what the anointing is not are very important because most people have wrong uh, interpretations of what that anointing is or what it's to be used for. And so we'll be taking this up. You know, I was raised in Pentecost. And I remember, um, you know, as I was growing up, I thought I'd never want to be a pastor. I ended up being one. But uh, when I was at my uh, in college, my uh, junior year at Oklahoma State University, I was really desperate that time seeking for the direction of the Lord in my life. And I was taking business administration, but I really wasn't that interested in it. And then one day, the presence of the Lord was in the room. I could sense it. And the Lord told me in that time period, he said, you're called to be a teacher in the body of Christ. And right there, I should have picked it up. I didn't pick it up that much, but there's an anointing that even comes with a teaching ministry. We often think a teaching ministry is dry and that really it's the evangelist that runs, runs around and screams and yells and all this, or a pastor really getting worked up in a sermon, that that's the anointing. And oftentimes that is maybe a manifestation of the anointing, but it is not the anointing. And uh, in teaching, I just know when I start to teach and that presence of the Lord is there, I see things in the scripture that I'm actually learning while I'm teaching people. I know the general outline of what I'm teaching, but there's points that will come along that I've never seen before. And uh, actually, it's one of those things where I tell myself on the inside, wow, I've never seen that before. But look how that lines up with this. So again, that's that revelation, scriptural revelation, a presence of scriptural revelation in my life, but it operates differently in different people. It can, again, come in the nine gifts of the Spirit. A manifestation may be a word of knowledge where the person ministry knows a need that's in somebody's life can even call that need out. Then have a word of wisdom after that for the answer to that. Here's the word of knowledge, which shows the problem. But here's the word of wisdom, which gives the answer. These are things that, again, operate and are still here today. Because when Jesus Christ gave them, he didn't take them back. So I'm going to take up nine points on what the anointing is not. And point number one is this. The anointing is not a substitute for preparation. Some preachers rely on Psalm 81.10 that says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Well, that's good, but that's not necessarily talking about every time you stand up to preach. You know, you don't need to study. Just open up your mouth and God will fill it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says this, study to show yourself approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Studying to show yourself approved to God is a command given to us. This isn't a wish or an option. It is a command. And in there's a work that's attached to it, but it's almost like a reward of the work you do. The anointing comes upon it because study is important. Opening up the word of God and, and instructing yourself in it from, say, other authors and things is great. But to actually have that anointing, it's almost like that reward for just doing something so simple, studying. And God said, let me add that cherry on top. Let me add that anointing on top that's going to make this thing work. And the people will sense the presence of God. I like it when people can walk away and say, man, God was in that place. Well, who preached? I don't know his name, but man, God showed up in that service. So again, we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Although God can, and he does cover emergencies, don't use the anointing as an excuse not to prepare. There was a time one time when I was coming in on Wednesday, I was studying at the office on Wednesday, I was going to go home and finish my studies, but that morning somebody died. Man, I had to drop everything and go to the side of the of the wife and the kids and, and talk to them and stuff and get things prepared. And when I got back, then somebody walked through the door and said, man, my wife's about to leave me, Pastor, please, can you talk to me? And so I end up talking, but we, I must have spent an hour to an hour and 15 minutes with the man about what to do because he kept bringing up questions and things like that. And by the end of the day, I didn't even get to study my sermon. I mean, I, I actually was totally unprepared. But I walked into the service that night and said, God, you'd better show up because you know what? I'm showing up, the people are showing up, and my trust is in you. I didn't get to study today to show myself approved, but you better show up. And I mean, that sermon was incredible. I even, while I was preaching, thought, wow, I've never seen this before. Things were coming to me, and God was making up for the fact that an emergency had arisen, and he covered it. But you know, there was a real temptation after that service. When people came up and said, wow, Pastor, that was really good tonight. Thanks for that that sermon. And I was thinking the whole time, it wasn't me. That was totally God. It was 100% God and 0% Bob that night. 
But boy, was there a temptation after that service to say, man, I should do this all the time. Just just goof off and stuff and then come to church. No, it doesn't work that way because study to show yourself approved unto God is there. Again, when emergencies arise, the Holy Spirit will cover. Isaiah 28 tells us the best way to literally walk into that anointing and then prepare for it while it's while you're ministering. It is Isaiah 28, 11, with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. Paul said this, he said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, speaking of the Corinthian church who spoke in tongues a lot. But he said about them, he says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all, but in the church, I'd rather speak five words in a known language rather than hundreds and thousands of words in an unknown tongue. And he was simply saying most of his tongues are outside the church, but in the church, I, I speak in tongues, but in the church. And so again, he's saying that preparation for your life by, by, um, by Isaiah 28, stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. God can show me things while I'm studying. While I'm driving, I can pray in the spirit. This helps open up guidance in my life, but it also is the preparation for that physical, tangible anointing to be there while I'm ministering the word of God. Study and inspiration don't need to compete with each other. I'm gonna say that again. Study and inspiration don't need to compete with each other. We think inspiration means I totally abandon myself to the Holy Spirit. Study means, well, I don't depend on the Holy Spirit at all. It's going to come because of my study. When God says it takes a combination of the two, your study is then backed by an inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But once I've done my study, I need to totally open myself up. I can say this, probably of all the mistakes I have made in ministry, and I look back on a sermon, it wasn't that good. Most of my mistakes have not been a lack of study, but a lack of prayer. I think and it must keep wanting to go over the, the notes over and over and over again. So to not prepare and expect the anointing to bail you out is presumptuous. It will be evidenced by shallow preaching and it'll be evidenced by shallow results. We should never be overconfident that what we have prepared needs no trusting in the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna say that again, that's so powerful. We should never be overconfident that what we have prepared needs no trusting in the Holy Spirit. My Lord, the Holy Spirit wrote what we're studying. He wants to speak to us while we're studying, but most of all, when we preach it, he wants to speak through us to the congregation because the end result is not how good my sermon was. The end result was what kind of results happened in the people who are listening. And so again, we have what we're offering here on the Holy Spirit will be a blessing to you. And I know that you're going to be blessed by it. So the announcer is going to come on tell you, you can have a copy of this for yourself. When we get back, we'll go on to point number two. There's going to be nine points. Again, we're going to be on this for a couple of days on again, understanding the anointing of God, understanding the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you that are watching right now that are ministers, pastors, youth directors, those who have uh, home groups and things like that, you might just have a gift to teach. You may not stand in the office of a teacher, but you just have a gift to teach. You need this because God doesn't just pick pastors and evangelists and five-fold ministers, anyone that open this up. And on top of that, when you witness to somebody, why don't you trust in that tangible anointing of the Holy Spirit to do what you can't do? I can minister it. I can speak it, but only the Holy Spirit can draw them in. We'll see you right after the break. The Holy Spirit has always been with man, but only in a limited ministry before Pentecost. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit lived in a temple made with hands and came on individuals at certain times to do a certain task. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the veil of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, not just to let us in, but to let the Holy Spirit out. From that day until this, the Holy Spirit desires to live in every person who will be born again. In Life and Power, Bobby Indian carefully examines the Holy Spirit's ever-present role in our daily life, the types and shadows that explain His ministry, and how the world was changed when He came into the upper room, filling New Testament believers with boldness and power. Life and Power is available in book form as audio CDs or downloads, video DVDs, or as both audio and video on a USB flash drive. To order Life and Power, visit bobbyandian.com slash lifeandpower. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. 
If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. This tangible anointing of the Holy Spirit can also be for anyone, especially in times of study. We're all supposed to study the Word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God is not just necessarily for a pastor or an evangelist, but for anybody because we're all supposed to feed on the Word of God. Offering our daily bread God gives to us is for everyone. And so again, the points I'm bringing out to ministers can be applied to anybody in life. The first point I talked about was the anointing is not a substitute for preparation. Point number two is this. The anointing is not a shortcut to success. Immature people think if I have a great anointing, I'll be respected and have great success. But without other areas of your life and ministry being matured, you cannot be a success, and if you would be, it would be tragic. Your gift can take you where your character cannot sustain you. There are no shortcuts, no substitutes in ministry. Anointing does not replace endurance, character, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, honesty, humility, and above all, a servant's heart. You know, we look back at ministers, you know, I came up through the 1940s, 1950s, and saw the great healing movements across the country, across the United States. And of course, it spread around the world. But you know, so many ministers that were in that literally had terrible lives. They had lives where they didn't live up to the things of God. And I look back on it, probably the one minister that I can look at who really did not believe much in the power of the Holy Spirit was Billy Graham. He said he believed in healing, but he never preached on it because he said, I don't totally understand it. But you know what made his ministry last so long? He outlasted so many ministers. And up until the time he died, I mean, the greatest respect across the country and around the world. You know why? It was because of his integrity. It was because of his honesty, his humility. It was said of him that before he ever went to a hotel, he had his people call ahead and 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 turn off. At that time, they had a black box on top of the television, which was the adult channels. He had him turn that off before he ever got there. He wasn't one that got there and then turned it off or called the front desk. It was done ahead of time. He told his staff, if you're ever with me, he said, and the door opens up to a to a to uh, an elevator and there's a woman there by herself. He said, I will not get on that with, and just me and her be on there. He said, I don't want the door to open up and I'm on there with a woman and somebody see it. And so he covered everything. I mean, he went to things you to think, really? He had a ministry uh, meeting in Tulsa one time. And uh, at the end of the meeting, we got back a sheet of papers with all the expenses. Let me tell you what's on this thing. It got down to 10 cents for this and 30 cents for that, for the meeting. And my look, I looked at it and said, I don't really care, but you know what? He cared. He cared to show everything that he had. This was the servant's heart. Look how long his ministry lasted while there were other ministers around. I mean, these guys, some of them were alcoholics, some of them were, were fooling around with women and things like that. And yet there comes a time in their own life when eventually their ministry just fell apart and they didn't last as long. Kenneth Hagin said this, I, I referred to him quite often. I got to work for him and the, the, the maturity of this man amazed me. He actually told some of these ministers, he said, my ministry is gonna outlast yours, not because I'm a better preacher. Many of you are better preachers than I am. He said, I'm gonna outlast you because I built on the word of God and integrity. I haven't built my ministry on the Holy Spirit all by itself. So again, we come back to this. Point number two is the anointing is not a shortcut to success. And there, there's, there's prices you must pay in the ministry because it comes through maturity, not just through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Next of all, point number three is the anointing is not a stamp of approval. A tangible anointing is not God's endorsement of your ministry. Any heart that's opened up to the Holy Spirit and is prepared for that sermon or whatever they're gonna be doing, whether it's witnessing to somebody, you prepared some things inside your heart, it, God doesn't just put that as a stamp of approval on you. No, it doesn't mean you're better than anybody else. It doesn't mean you're accurate in everything. It doesn't mean that everything you say or do is necessarily right and you're even living right. It's no stamp of approval on you. There's a difference between being uh, anointed and your message being anointed. And this is what happens when we stand up there. Oftentimes the anointing comes on the word of God and the ministry feels it, the minister feels it. But some ministers, even living in gross sin, preach great messages, seeing people saved and healed. Why? Because their message and that service was anointed by the Holy Spirit, even though this minister himself may not be at the time. But eventually, though, that sin catches up with him. Just like I said about Brother Hagin and what he said, and some people take that stamp as, look, the Holy Spirit's approval is on my life because of the anointing that's on me. No, again, even in the Old Testament, carnal believers 
There was a time when Saul was carnal. And then there's a time when, when uh, Balaam uh, stood on a mountain and, and began to proclaim the word of the Lord. And he tried not to proclaim the, the things of the Lord, but that anointing came on him and all that came out was great things. But yet this man was a terrible carnal believer, a terrible carnal prophet. And so even though, again, sin catches up with you, power, lusts, drunkenness, adultery, and money have destroyed many. Another great example of a carnal believer in the Old Testament doing great things was Samson. Samson had the, God, the anointing of God on him, but he didn't live for the Lord, and his ministry was short. He came to a short time at the end of his ministry, and he died because of it. But yet during that time, the, the anointing and things like that were so powerful. We look back at ministers today, some that even set, you know, still have books written about them, great things about them, and yet their lives were short of it. So the anointing is not a stamp of approval on your ministry. Number four is this. Anointing is not something synonymous with a specific style of preaching. There's different expressions of God's Holy Spirit. Some people love verse by verse teaching. That's me. I love verse by verse teaching. To me, that's the way the Bible was written. It says in Isaiah 28, it should be line upon line and precept upon precept. Others prefer inspirational preaching. I was raised around inspirational preaching, but the ones that stuck with me for all these years are ones who taught during the preaching. It wasn't just a couple of, of, of uh, scriptures and then just preaching a sermon around it. Some like prophesying and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And when they hear the prophets coming to town that's gonna prophesy over people, great crowds come because why? There's a certain type of person that loves that. I enjoy being around it, but my again, my great preference is walking out of a service learning something. I'm walking out smarter than when I came in and I made up my mind as a pastor. I wanted people to walk away smarter than when they came in. Some like soft music, some like quiet music, others like it loud, others like the music to be energetic where you really feel the beat of that song. We all have personal references and personal preferences, but it's important not to become closed-minded that our type is the best. We have that in church so often where people say, well, you should have this style of music. I was just at a church and the pastor told me, he said, because that area is part of the country, they want more country style songs, more country and Western style. He said, we put some in there. But he said, the moment I put one or two in there, everybody's yelling, all of them, all of them. We need them all to be that same way. Well, again, you need a variety of things, including hymns and songs, maybe from 10 years ago and songs being written today and all different styles. So God can use all types of ministry methods to reach different people, the anointing doesn't come because you use one specific style. Some people again think that the anointing follows preachers, those that preach and perspire and yell and scream and that's what really causes the anointing to come. No, that's just not true. You can be up there like I am, just sitting down and speaking the word of God and anointing will come. It's a teaching anointing to where people can start to understand the teaching and how the points come together. The Holy Spirit will inspire me and show me how to put that together and the people through the Holy Spirit put it together. And one other great thing that I think happens because of the anointing, I can preach on one thing and 500 people can hear it 500 different ways. The Holy Spirit can take it from my mouth and actually turn it by that anointing and cause it to minister something. I've had people come to me after a sermon and say, Pastor, that was a great sermon. Let me tell you what I got out of it. And when they start to describe what they got out of it, I'll think the whole time I'm nodding like this, I'll think, that's not at all what I preached on. How did you get that out of what I preached? But they said, even on the way to church this morning, I was praying because I had a need in my life. And pastor, you just answered it so accurately. And I'm thinking, but that's not what I preached on. I don't even remember referring to that, but the Holy Spirit did. This again comes back with the anointing of God is not synonymous with a specific style of preaching. All right, let me take point number five. Point number five is this. The anointing doesn't make you superior. And some people think that. Man, I've got an anointing on my life, so I'm just better than everybody else. I have been to services and been in the back room. I was in one particular service where we had three or four ministers that were national ministers, but they invited me in. I was not a national minister. was not nationally known, but they, again, liked me, so they put me in there. And I actually sat in the back room. And boy, did I feel inferior. We had Brother Doodad in there. We had sister so-and-so in there. I mean, these were people that were known worldwide. And I was so astonished at the arrogance of some of these people. One man actually said, God has called me to win the whole world. By television, it's gonna happen. 
and these other guys just might as well quit because I'm the one called at this time to do that. I was, I was shocked at the lack of understanding or the lack of humility in this man's life to realize we're all called together in one body. But anyway, as he was talking along, my first thought was, well, what happens in countries that don't have televisions? What happens in huts out there? And what happens to people who are living, you know, in the backwoods somewhere? What happens to nations that have gone through war, such as that time Vietnam? And you, you have these huts out there and people, you know, uh, going out and raising uh, uh, rice and stuff, you know, and you see, but they don't have a television. You don't see a satellite dish out there or something. How are they supposed to hear you on TV? It still comes back to the best type of witnessing is go you individually into all the world and preach the gospel. One-on-one -on -one evangelism is, is always the best, but still, again, it wasn't that so much a point. I could have argued with him all I want to. I just sat there. I felt too respectful of the man's ministry to say anything. I thought, what a terrible thing to say. And so again, Gordon Lindsay said some spiritual moves. Gordon Lindsay was the head of the ministry in Dallas, Texas. Anyway, a great teaching ministry right now, great praise and worship leaders coming out of there. But he said that some spiritual moves have been blessed by God then faded away because of the erratic and arrogant conduct of its leaders. One such move, he said, occurred some years ago in America. We were joyful about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but we soon saw changes that alarmed us. Some of the leaders claimed they were the powerhouse and all other churches had dried up. People were to come to them for a recharge. This is simply called arrogance. I've said this before, but arrogance is the only disease that makes everyone sick except the one who has it. The anointing is not given to create a celebrity, but to empower a minister to meet people's needs. If God anoints you to flow in the gifts of healing, it's because he wants you to heal sick people. If God anoints you to teach, it's because he wants his people to have knowledge of himself. If God anoints you as an evangelist, it's because he wants lost people to hear the word of God and be saved. It simply comes back to this again. The Lord is telling you here through this, be a human being. Understand this, God puts his spirit in human beings and God anoints human beings and it doesn't make you a better human being because you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And again, just before we leave today, thank you to all of my partners. You know, you made this possible. I've got a gift, I've got an anointing, but you know what? It's all of us working together, the giving, the prayer, and all the different things you do. If you'd like to become a partner with me, go to my website, bobyandian.com. You'll find a place on there where you can become a partner with me, join me. Our hearts are joined first because you love what I'm teaching you, identify with it. But next of all, it comes by holding out a physical hand and say, I wanna join my hand with yours and becoming a partner, a monthly partner in giving. I wanna thank you ahead of time and we will see you next time. Ministers, you can access valuable resources free at ministersclub.com. You'll find topical studies, sermon outlines, PDF books, answers to many questions, and plenty of encouragement, all free. Just go to ministersclub.com. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.